Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way that holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Peter is writing to Christians who are learning to live in, a, in God's way in a world that is hostile towards people who are committed to Jesus Christ. He's already talked about how believers are supposed to act when under a hostile government or working for a hostile employer. Now he's just to talking about being in a marriage where your spouse is hostile or unresponsive to your Christian faith. You're a believer, and he's not, and he shows little to no interest in Christ. And so the principles Peter suggests here are really the same for whether you're a man or a woman married to an unbeliever, and they're also true for if you're a believer and you're relating to somebody who's an unbeliever. The context for marriage, however, is a, was a lot different than it is today. Marriage is it's a challenging relationship as it is, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. Max Licato says, during the celebration of his 30th wedding anniversary, a friend of mine shared the secret of their happy marriage. This is what he said. Early on, my wife suggested an arrangement. She would make all the small decisions, and I would, and only would come to me for the major ones. Wouldn't you know that all these years have passed, and we haven't had one major decision? Well, in general, we live in a world that is hostile towards marriage. The Bible teaches that marriage, for the most part, the Bi how, what the Bible teaches about marriage, for the most part, has been rejected. It's been turned upside down and perverted. Marriage where a man and a woman are committed to loving each other and living in a way that God wants them to live with each other is becoming rare all the time. The scriptures describe marriage in terms of a mystery and compares it to Christ's relationship with the church. God's way for a man and a woman to live together in marriage, it doesn't make sense to the world. It may not make sense to you either unless you're committed to walking in Jesus' steps. So when Peter says, wives in the same way, the same way refers back to the example of Jesus. He goes on and he says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. So he's quoting, quoting from Isaiah 53. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus models for how, how we are to act in the face of hostile governments, employment situations, and being married to a spiritually incompatible mate. Now how this situation rose in the first place, especially for women at that time, had to do with the social structures of the day and in that part of the world. It's important to understand the cultural situation at the time, or we will misread what Peter is saying and to whom he is speaking to. Now, as Westerners, we are individualistic. Our, our society encourages us to be 
independent and individual thinkers and to make our own choices. But it's not that way in many parts of the world, even today. The Eastern world, however, is made up more of collectivist societies. And, and what that means is your identity comes from the group and the decisions are made with the approval of the group. What the group thinks and believes is valued above what you personally believe and think. Usually the elders or heads of the group make the decisions for everybody else. Marriage, for example, was not just between a man and a woman. It was between families, and it was decision made by the two families. And so as an individual, you had virtually no say about your marriage, especially if you were a woman. Enter Christianity to the picture. When the man the recognized head or Lord, if you will, of the household decided for Christ, it affected the whole family. His conversion to Christ also meant the family was converted to Christ. We see this in the case of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16.33 where it says, He and all his family were baptized. But what about cases where women became believers and their husbands didn't? Well, that's what Peter's talking about. This was a dangerous situation that we probably can't fully appreciate as individualistic thinkers. A wife who became a Christian by herself put her life and her marriage in danger if her husband disapproved. How was a woman to live as a Christian and influence a husband who was possibly hostile to her faith? Well, in a patriarchal society, a husband had the authority to pressure his wife to live exactly the way that he wanted her to. So in answering the, this question, you know, the question underneath the text is, how do I live with an unbelieving spouse? Peter gets at the heart of what makes a marriage work, any marriage. It's what's so mysterious about Christian marriages. It's what makes it a Christian marriage. It's what makes you a Christian in your marriage, whether your spouse is a Christian or not. In a word, it's the word submission. The overriding quality of living as a Christian in a hostile world is submission. That's what Peter talks about all the way through his letter. Submission suffers from an image problem. As we said a few weeks ago, it's a dirty word when it comes to relationships. You know, who wants to submit? Well, Peter has already told us back in chapter 2, verse 21, he says to this, you know, as a follower of Christ, you were called. But Christ, because Christ suffered for you, you should, leaving you an example, you should follow in his steps. Your example of living God's way in marriage is Jesus Christ. Nobody ever submitted more to God than Jesus did. Nobody ever submitted more for the sake of human relationships than Jesus did. When Peter wrote, Wives, in the same way be submissive to your husbands, he was talking about being submissive in the same way Christ was submissive in a hostile world. Submission, the very thing that has taken on a negative slant, is the most positive ingredient in a healthy marriage. You see, there are three ways that you can live in life. My way, somebody else's way, or God's way. Now, my way is how society teaches you to live. You know, my way is about me doing what I want to do because I want to do it. It's all about me and what I want. That means I put my needs, my desires, my wishes, my preferences above everybody else. But notice what Paul says about that in Philippians Chapter 2, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You know, somebody else's way, then, is what people think submission might be all about. You know, it's doing what others say because I want to make them happy. And so I'm going to do everything exactly the way that they want it done because 
That's what I'm supposed to do, and I think that's what the Bible expects me to do. So I'm underneath them. I, you know, I don't have a choice. And so some people end up suffering in abusive, destructive, unhealthy marriages because they believe they have to give in to whatever their spouse gives out. When it comes to submission to the Bible, you need to think of it in these terms. Having the courage to give up my rights to meet somebody else's needs. Submission is a byproduct of love. And it's built on the respect and honor due to any person made in the image of God. When we submit, we give up certain rights by allowing somebody else to decide. But this assumes we aren't compromising our core rights and beliefs by submitting. You have certain basic rights or freedoms that should not infringe any way upon your ability to love others sacrificially and to die to self as God's Word teaches us. You are free not to condone or allow sinful behaviors or tendencies in your interactions with others. You are free to have boundaries to protect yourself from harmful behaviors. You're free to be the person God created you to be, even if it doesn't line up with somebody else's expectations. You belong to God first and foremost. You are free to feel your feelings, even if somebody else doesn't like what you feel or how you express it. If you express your emotions in a sinful way, however, you must bring them to God and ask Him to help you deal with your heart. You don't have to change your feelings simply to please somebody else. God does not authorize anybody else to be in charge of your emotions. And you are not responsible for how others express their feelings, only for yours. You're free to say no to something another person requests from you when it goes against your God-given conscience and responsibilities. Just because people request things from us doesn't mean that we automatically need to reply. We need God's discernment and judgment to do the things He asks us to do, not to give in to pressure or simply please others, especially when it's not what God wants us to do. And that's where Andy Stanley's question comes in. His question is that we need to always ask ourselves when it comes to relationships and what we're supposed to do, the question is, what does love require me to do? God's love and His leading are to guide our choices, not coercion, guilt, or obligation. Ultimately, it's about living a life of complete submission to Jesus Christ. Because I'm surrendered to Him, that affects how I relate to you. I relate to you in a way that shows I'm surrendered to Him. And I serve you in such a, a way that my life tells the story of who He is. Peter is talking about an attitude of unselfishness that tells the story of what it means to live God's way. So God's way is, is not about being a doormat where you let other people walk all over you and whatever they want is what happens. And it's also not about being a tank where you run over everybody else with what you want, where your wants squish everybody else's wants. It's something else altogether called submission. It is having the courage to surrender certain needs in order to meet somebody else's needs. It's giving up certain needs to meet their greatest need, which is the need for Jesus Christ. It's being sacrificially unselfish as I serve others with the love of Christ. Well, in a Christian marriage, it's God's will that both partners first submit themselves completely to Christ and then unselfishly give themselves for the other. As believers, we are to submit to Christ in everything. Paul writes about this same thing in Ephesians chapter 5. He says in verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And then in verse 25, he starts speaking to husbands. He says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The only way that husbands can love their wives as Christ loved the church and wives can submit to their husbands as to the Lord, 
is if they are giving themselves up, first of all, to him, and then for each other. So when Peter writes here and says, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won without words by the behavior of their wives. He's saying how you live as a Christian wife hasn't changed. Just because your spouse is an unbelieving man doesn't change the fact that you are to honor him and to give yourself for him just as you were as, as if he were following me. Sacrificially unselfish living is the key to being a Christian, no matter what kind of relationship you're in. Christian love, 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, is not rude, it's not self-seeking, it doesn't get easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Christian love is always about making sacrifices. If there's no sacrifice in your service, then there's nothing of Christ's love in your giving. If you live an, uh, live an unselfish life to make yourself help, happy, then you're still not living an unselfish life. You're still living for yourself, for, for what you can get out of it. If you only sacrificially give of yourself as long as you get something back from the other person, then you're still being selfish. And you'll eventually have to stop giving sacrificially, too, because submission is about giving of yourself regardless of what you get back. You do it out of love for Christ and out of love for the other person. So what did Christ get back when he gave of himself unselfishly? He got insults. He was mistreated. He was put to death. Now, did that stop him from giving his all? Of course not. Now, I'm not saying you should just take whatever comes your way and accept abusive treatment, but how you respond does matter. I'm talking about what motivates you in your marriage. Is it the love of Christ, or is it really selfishness? You know, who are you doing it all for, honestly? Self-centeredness is the ever-present enemy of every relationship. It, it can raise an ugly heart in any moment. It reminds me of the place where God says to Cain in Genesis 4, 7, just before he kills his brother, Cain's sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. What you must never forget is that self is always crouching at the door of your life. It wants to have you. It wants to pounce on you and on others. It wants to devour you and others. When selfishness is allowed to run loose in your heart, Christ's love will not come through in your service or your relationships. Now, Peter is not just talking to Christian wives. As we read earlier, he's talking to Christian husbands about the same kind of issue. This is what he says in verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them as respect with respect as the weaker partner, and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Husbands are not to use their authority to lord it over their wives. You know, I'm, I'm the boss man. I'm going to tell you what to do. Well, that's not how Christ did it. Christ gave himself up for the church. Peter says, be considerate of your wife's needs. Literally, live with her in an understanding way. You know, what does she need? Treat her with respect, not contempt. Don't look down on her if, as if somehow she's inferior to, to you. <clears throat> I mean, that's totally been misused by many people. She may be partially weaker than you, but she's a partner with you. She's not morally weaker spiritually weaker or, or even intellectually weaker. And if you treat her that way, you're not as strong as you think you are. If you don't love her God's way, it will affect your relationship with her and with God himself. Peter says it will hinder your prayers. The way I act towards others affects my relationship with God. You, 
you can do it your way. You can use your selfish energy to serve yourself, or you can do it God's way, relying on his power. Selfishness at its very core says, I'm depending on myself. I'm going to use my strength to get what I want. But when I'm given to prayer, instead, what that says is, I'm depending on God. I'm going to entrust myself to him. I'm submitting my weakness to his strength. In Ephesians 5.21, the last mark of a spirit-filled person is to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. If you're serving your spouse in the power of the Spirit, you have what you need to face the challenges of your marriage. You must either rely on yourself or the Holy Spirit. That determines who really wins in your marriage. You, your spouse, or Christ. Selfishness makes you blind to your sin while you're hyper sensitive and offended and angry by what your spouse does. Without the help of the Holy Spirit continually refilling your tank with himself, with his attitude, with his inner beauty, with his sacrificial love, you'll find it impossible to submit to the needs of another person for any length of time without becoming resentful. You cannot make any significant headway against your self-centeredness and give of yourself sacrificially without the ongoing help of the Holy Spirit. Too many people stop praying for His help and try to power through marital struggles in their own strength. It's no wonder Christ seems absent during the most difficult seasons of marriage. So Peter encourages Christian wives by saying, Unselfishness is the way to influence your unbelieving husband. They may not be interested in the word, but they're watching your behavior. What is the most powerful tool for changing somebody else? Your unselfishness. Jesus Christ was the most unselfish person who ever walked on earth. He gave himself totally and unselfishly for everybody. His unselfish love is what changed more people's lives than anything else. He didn't do it for himself. He did it out of love for others. He did it to please God. Instead of trying to change your spouse, love them unselfishly. For you, God says, the way to, inf to have influence for me is not by trying to take power over somebody. Influence through power, control, intimidation. It doesn't change the world, at least not in any positive way. It doesn't really change hearts either. That's totally the way of the world. No, he says, I'm calling you to a different approach. So sacrificial love, so sacrificially love the people around you who don't believe what you believe. That's what starts to affect them. They begin to see that you're not only out for yourself, but you're out for them too. Your love and service will be attractive to them. You'll be attractive to them too. You'll have in real influence. What does that way of gaining influence come from? Where does it come from? Jesus Christ. That's what Peter is saying here. How can you have the greatest influence? Well, this is how he words it. He says, When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to make themselves beautiful. Your best chance of winning your spouse over to Christ is by your behavior, your spirit, your inner beauty, your submissive attitude, your unselfish, sacrificial giving of yourself. The greatest attraction of your life should come from your inner beauty. That says something in the world that is focused on the 
outward beauty of a woman. You know, that says, work on the outside, wear the right clothing, and maybe you can seduce a man. But Peter says, work on your heart more than you work on your appearance. Now, he's not saying that you have to ignore your appearance. But true beauty comes from the spirit, not the store. To win another person to Christ, you need to have soul-seducing beauty. You mean, that's the kind of beauty that lasts over the long haul, because, you know, this outward beauty doesn't last forever. You need to put on something that not only stirs a man's heart, but stirs his, as as stirs a man's desires, but stirs his heart for God. Paul talked about how you dress with soul-seducing beauty. He says in Colossians 3.23, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now Peter uses Sarah as an example. He says, Be like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. Now, ladies, don't panic. Peter's not saying, call your husband Lord and do exactly whatever he tells you to do. That completely misses the point. He's saying, respect your husband. If you don't respect your husband, there's no way he's going to be seduced by the beauty of Christ in you. Love your spouse in a way that shows who the real master of your life is. How do you show respect for your husband and at the same time display the beauty of Christ? Peter tells you exactly how to do it. This is what he says in verse 4. Your real beauty is that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. The Greek word for gentle describes a once wild horse that has been tamed. It's strength now under God's control. A gentle woman is now under the control of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has tamed you. He's tamed your emotions when they're triggered. The Spirit has tamed your mouth when you're angry. The Spirit has tamed the way you react when you're mistreated. A man can tell when a woman has been broken by the power of the Spirit. She will obey God and display God. That is her beauty. A quiet spirit leads a woman to feel no controlling urge to get even when she's been hurt and to return evil for evil. She continues to serve unselfishly and trust God unreservedly. The purity and reverence of her life tells who really is her Lord. This is how holy women have always made themselves beautiful to God and to their husbands. A Christian woman tells about her parents' marriage. She says, when my mother and dad were married, she was a new believer, and he had recently gone forward in a church service to receive Christ as his Savior. It became evident, however, that my dad had no interest in anything spiritual. So through the years, he would drive us to church, and some years, he would even attend at Christmas. My mother faithfully lived for the Lord and taught us from the Word. When I was 13, she found out that my dad had been unfaithful. I can still remember a few days later, sitting at the kitchen table, as she read to me from 1 Corinthians 7.13, If the unbelieving husband wishes to remain, let him remain. That settled it for her. Theirs was not a happy marriage, but we were a family. Twenty-nine years later, in a morning service in a small church on his 72nd birthday, my dad stood at the invitation and truly accepted Jesus as his Savior. And then she parenthetically says, We were all there and Kleenex was passed up and down the aisle. He was a changed man. He prayed. They had a Bible study in their home. And six years later, he went to be with the Lord he loved. Joined five years later by my mother. I praise the Lord for his faithfulness and for the mother's obedience to Scripture and faithful witness through the years. I can't promise you that an unbelieving spouse will put his or her faith 
in Christ. However, I can promise you this. If you put on the unselfish sacrifice of Jesus Christ, His beauty in you will have soul-seducing power. So do you need Him to fill you with His gentle and quiet spirit today? Lord Jesus, we ask you to work in all of our hearts so that we are the kind of person like you were that has impact in all of our relationships, whether we're married to a believing or an unbelieving spouse, that the love and person of Christ might come through in our life. Whether it's interacting with an employer or a neighbor, a family member, a friend, somebody who needs Christ. Oh God, may your spirit have such control over us that we will humble ourselves, be submissive, and show your spirit through our lives. And may you use that to draw people into a relationship with you. May we be that kind of person today. By your power of your spirit, we pray. Amen.